we now start the first of three international forums, uh, three of the three conversations of ICOMOS, uh, ICOMOS International in combination with the ICOMOS Mexican Committee on our world to Mondia call to 2022. ICOMOS uh, Mexican Committee welcomes you as the host country. Those that have registered to this webinar, we remind you that you have interpretation function. You may select the language of your choice at the globe icon in the lower right hand side of your screen. I am so very pleased to introduce and to give the floor to architect uh, Saul Onofre, uh, Mexican chair of Mexican ICOMOS. He will be moderating and issuing the welcoming address. He will be moderating the International Forum of uh, Policies and Heritage uh, Practices for the Management of Sustainable Future Ideas, Actions of the Past, the Present, and the Future. Uh, Dr. Saul Arcantara Onofre is a professor at the Autonomous Metropolitan University of Azcapotzalco campus. He is the chair of the Mexican Culture Seminar, an emeritus uh, member of the Mexican National Architectural Academy, president and chair of uh, Mexican ICOMAS chapter, co-author of five books regarding the cultural heritage and over 150 journals regarding the recovery and providing value to the cultural and natural heritage of Mexico. He has been uh, participating in over 30 restoration projects of the cultural heritage and natural heritage. He is a founder, coordinator, and a postgraduate in design, planning, and landscape conservation at, at the um, Autonomous uh, Metropolitan University of Azcapotzalco. It is an honor for me to give the floor to Dr. Saul Alcantara Onofre for his welcoming address. Uh, Dr. Alcantara, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. For me, it is an honor to welcome our distinguished panel members uh, to uh, Jurema Machado, Juan Liz Isaza, Francesco Bandarin, Carmen Ayon, uh, and Emma Luengo, and Monica Luengo, and Olympia Niglio. I welcome all of you to this reflecting table looking uh, our retrospective of the Mondia Cult program. 2022, let me express my gratitude uh, to Guadalupe Cepeda, uh, Gabriel Caballero, and Olympia Niglio, and also uh, Karina Mendez. You are most welcome to our reflecting table. And let me give the floor to Gabriel, Gabriel Caballero at this point. Thank you very much, uh, so, um and welcome everyone. I will share my slides and I have prepared something for everyone for my introduction. So good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening to all our colleagues who are joining us today. Welcome everyone. I'm excited to be here in this uh, ECOMOS Sustainable De Development Goals Working Group, uh, ECOMOS Mexico and the Ministry of Culture for this event entitled ECOMOS uh, Mondial 2022 Culture Forum culture and heritage policies and practices for sustainable development, past, present, and future. Today, we're looking back to the 1982 Mondecote Conference and its aftermath. I'm here to provide an introduction uh, to Mondecote in general. So the Mondecote Conference in 1982 was a gathering of member states of UNESCO, and several issues on cultural policies were discussed, and a conference agreed on the definition of culture as the whole complex of distinctive, spiritual, material, intellectual, and emotional features that characterize a society or social group. It includes not only the arts and letters, but also modes of life, the fundamental rights of human beings, and value systems, traditions, and belief. I think uh, this is a, a 1982 conference really made an impact because it defined or celebrated the, the cultural diversity of the world. The conference produced the, uh, the Mexico City Declaration, which proclaims that everyone has the rights to participate in the cultural life and enjoy the arts. The aim was to open up new channels for democracy through equality and opportunity in culture, 
and the Mexico City Declaration has expanded the concept of culture and cultural heritage, as well as marked the need to include cultural perspectives in development policies. It was also the foundation of other UNESCO declarations, as you can see here, uh, the Declaration for um, uh, Cultural Diversity and the, the, the future conventions of the 2005 Convention on Cultural Diversity and the 2003 Con Convention on Intangible Cultural Heritage. Uh, prior to the meeting in, of 1982, uh, several regional conferences started from the 1970s uh, that, um, uh, that what the United States started uh, the movement of cultural de uh, um, development. It started with Venice in 1970, Helsinki, Georgia-Karta, Accra, Bogota, and Baghdad in 1981. Uh, so it was an 11-year process, and it reached um, uh, Mexico in 1982. It is notable that the work of UNESCO and its aspirations for cultural diversity also indirectly brought forward the development of ministries of culture all over the world as part of the government agencies that report on cultural policies. Now, most countries will have the national ministries of culture. As you can see in this uh, slide, the ministries of culture before 1982 was around 62 uh, countries. And afterwards, most countries now have the ministries of culture. Um, this year, a new conference in Mexico is being arranged by UNESCO and the government of Mexico, entitled um, Mondico 2022, UNESCO World Conference on Cultural Policies and Sustainable Development. It will look at new priorities of cultural policies. New issues have emerged, as well as challenges. COVID-19, uh, conflicts, inequalities, and climate change need new policies relevant to culture. The cultural sector is faced with widespread disruptions, bringing forth the need for new adaptations for public policy spectrum. The role of culture to sustainable development has been made clearer as the disruption shows the role of culture in continuity, engagement, employment, and resilience of societies to advance social and economic development. It also gathers the regional perspectives and priorities of various countries through regional consultations and other activities. This conference will ask, what is the role of culture in the changing paradigm and new public policy? Uh, you can see on the right side, uh, some of the facts and figures that UNESCO sh uh, highlighted as the role of culture in the creative industries and economy. As you can see, two, two point, $2, uh, $2 trillion are coming from creative and cultural industries. And then 13% um, of uh, employment is also attributed to major cities. Uh, and um, I think uh, it also attribute, it's attributed to protection of land for future generations. 10,000 square kilometers of the lands uh, of the world are protected. And the role of achieving, um, the cultural role in achieving sustainable development. 47% uh, of the cultural industries uh, provides jobs to women and 90% of sites feature culture. So for the last few months, ECOMOS has been engaging UNESCO member states at the regional consultation at Mondico 2022. We believe that these meetings are important as they serve as the foundation of new priorities for UNESCO in the cultural sector on policies that are strongly anchored to sustainable development. ECOMOS was privileged enough to be able to present in the regional consultations that started from Europe and North America, Asia Pacific, African region, Latin America and the Arab states, and we are also gathering the perspectives of our ECOMAS regions for their priorities for cultural heritage policies. We have also done resilient art events, which allow civil society and the public to contribute further to the municipal process. Uh, the conversation that we're doing today is a collaboration between ECOMAS the Sustainable Development Goals Working Group, ECOMAS Mexico, and the Ministry of Culture of Mexico to look at culture and heritage policies and practices for sustainable development. At the backdrop of the decade of action for achieving the sustainable development goals, this first event will look at the critical development of culture and heritage policies inspired by the 1982 conference and 40 years of development of global policies and practices, linking culture and heritage uh, in the sustainable development process. I really wish everyone a, a very good conversation and I look forward to our, um, our conclusions for data. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriel Caballero, for this introduction. 
Ahora me we thank Gabriel Caballero for this introduction. Let me now introduce our, man, our panel members. Gabriel Caballero, he is a member of uh, ICOMOS of the Philippines, a country that is quite close to the Mexican uh, culture. You, you know, many of the works uh, in Filipinas were made by our Tlaxcala artisans. He's a leader of the Sustainable Development uh, Group of International ICOMOS. He has been awarded given the management of the cultural and natural heritage, and he acts as a focal point for the implementation of the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals of the International Council of Monuments and Sites, ICOMOS. His expertise ranges from sensitive landscape design intervention, cultural landscape research, sustainable development thinking, and world heritage management. Uh, Jurema Machado, she is a Brazil architect, and she was the chair of the National and Artistic Heritage and coordinator of uh, UNESCO in Brazil. Also, Juan Luis Isasa Londoño, Colombian architect, graduated by the Medellin Bolivarian University in 1985. He conducted studies of history of art, uh, Hispanic American, 1987, and high management of cultural um, assets in 2015. He has a PhD of architectural composition of the Politecnico Madrid University. He has performed as a member of the Board of National Monuments of Colombia and a member of the National Heritage. He has written several books and different documents in specialized journals. He's been a consultant of the International uh, Board of Sites and Monuments of ICOMOS, organization of which he's a member of, the, of UNESCO and the World Monuments Fund, WMF. We have Carmen Añon Feliu. At this point, Carmen and Monica Langue will be joining us momentarily. Carmen Añon Feliu, she is a Spanish landscaper, an expert in cultural landscapes and historic landscapes. She was the director of the Projectors of Rehabilitation for the Gardens of the Isle and the King of Aranjuez, uh, La Granja del Campo del Moro de la Zarzuela, Palacio de la Moncloa, de los Jardines de la Casita del Príncipe, El Príncipe en el Escorial, and the uh, Jardines de la Quinta del Duque del Arco, de los Jardines del Monasterio del Escorial, y el Claustro y Jardines de las Descalzas Reales. She was an advisor of the municipality of Madrid in the Madrid in the Corporation of 1979 to 1983, and she was elected by the Union of the Democratic Center of the Municipalities in 1979. In 2017, she was awarded the National uh, Recognition for Restoration and Conservation of Cultural Goods granted by the Ministry of Education, Culture, and Sports. And she's also been a co-author of the design of landscapes that we have had the first uh, postgraduate study and the only PhD in Latin America. Ban Francesco Bandarin, architect and urbanist, is expert in urban conservation from 2000 to 2010. He was the director of cultural uh, heritage of UNESCO. From 2010 to 2018, he was a cultural director of this uh, unit. He is the main advisor of Aga Khan uh, for culture. He has published the Urbanistic Landscape Management of Heritage in the Urban Environment 2012, Reconnecting the City, and the Focus of the Urbanic uh, Countryside, and the Future of the Urban Landscape 2015, Recovering the Urban Landscape in 2019. And he is now working in uh, the uh, Metropolitan uh, Heritage. Francisco Lopez Morales, architect, from the National Autonomous University in Urbanism, also a graduate from Grenoble University. He has created the books uh, uh, Mexican Arquitectura Vernacula, The Color of the Mexican Architecture, Funeral Popular Architecture in Mexico, The Arabic Presence in Latin America, among others. He's an advisory expert in the Committee of Heritage of UNESCO. He has presented posters about architecture and a member of the juries for different contests of international 
uh, areas in architecture and a member of the National System of Researchers, CONACYT, and a member of ICOMOS Mexico. Monica Luengo, he is, uh, she has an, uh, she is an art historian, architect, landscaper from Spanish, an expert in uh, world heritage. She studied in Madrid by the of, by the School of History, Art and Geography and History of the Complutense University in Madrid. She graduated cum laude uh, with her paper on image and aesthetics of the garden and uh, treaties. She is a member of the uh, honorary committee since 2019 to 2015. I contributed to work with her during this function and we both established the catalog for the historic gardens in Latin America. She's also a member of the scientific committee of the European Institute of Jardins et Paisage of the European Network of Historic Gardens and El Instituto de Estudios Madrileños. Olympia Niglia is an architect and Italian conservationist. She is graduated from the uh, University of Kyoto in Japan. She's an architect, graduated in 1995 with architectural conservation from Naples University. In 1999, she got her PhD in architectural conservation from Naples University, Frederick II. Since 2004, she's the head uh, journalist in architectural exempli d'architectura. She's a member of the scientific committee of the Architectural Heritage of Izar and a member of uh, the Forum UNESCO and ICOMOS Italy and also member of the International Scientific Committee of uh, Theory and uh, Conservation ICOMOS, International Arbiter of the Journal of Architectural Heritage. She was the director together with Aizuke Kuroda and the exhibit Giorgio Vasari Architect, Maria de Guadalupe Cepeda Martinez, she is a restorer of uh, assets of the uh, cultural heritage built on, on wood. She's a professor at the center of Ina Jalisco. She's the vice chair of ICOMOS Mexican chapter. She has been the vice president for the continent of the Americas uh, for the heritage built with wood in ICOMOS International. She has been a member of the committee of uh, drafting committee of the principles of conservation of the cultural heritage built in wood uh, adopted uh, in Delhi in 2017. She is now the head of the conservation de Petatera de Villa de Álvarez, Colima de Restauración del Mural Teatro de Goyado, Keles for the restoration of oil paintings, uh, Mexican fibers, and the role of restoration. She has written several books specialized in the cultural heritage management by the conservation restoration, and she is also a member of the National Institute of Anthropology and History. Well, as part of this conversation, first of all, we will give the floor to Curema Machado and Juan Luis Isasa Londoño, and we have two questions for them that I will read for you, for Curema Machado and Juan Luis Isasa, which were the visions or the hopes for cultural uh, policy before the Mondia cult meeting of 1982? That is the first question. Let me give the floor to Jurema Machado and then Juan Luis. Well, good day, good afternoon. It's a pleasure and an honor. And I am extremely happy to share with you this discussion regarding such an important uh, topic. As a matter of fact, the question has been regarding the relevance of Mandia Cult 1982 in regards to the cultural policies that have been developed after this meeting. I believe that it's very difficult to attribute uh, uh, or to give a quick uh, evaluation uh, to something that was quite a specific movement because of course things do change uh, constantly, and that's how we start uh, changing ideas until they create new concepts. I believe 1982 was this precise moment, of course. Yes, we. if I start by the uh, uh, end, but yes, 
this is a moment that had a strong impact in the UNESCO Convention's international documents regarding world heritage. And well, there is also a clear uh, breaking point here when the topic of uh, culture and heritage has been uh, checked in our federal constitution dating 1988 with an article that deals with the cultural heritage management that is in coherence with what has been stated by the 1982 declaration and convention. This has given way to a change in our heritage policies. We consider the cultural identity, the intangible uh, heritage that is considering the diversity of the country in a mixed way. I believe there is here an issue that I do not know if it is relevant for us as professionals from the very first moment in which we had contact with uh, this declaration, because it is a very strong relationship that is quite precise in some of the moments, because the impression was that we were somehow static. That is no minor thing, because we can see that we have to work within the concept so beyond our specific professional field of work. My belief is that uh, as we will be creating a new document in 2022, then this new document should be allowing us to have such a major communication uh, in regards to what we had in 1982. It's possible that this new document will entail different consequences and relations with the different policies of UNESCO and the different documents created by ICOMOS with the general principles of the identity concept, the development relationship uh, that will come uh, as taken different directions in the general policies of the United Nations in regards to culture and heritage. So this document, uh, there are things that we have not achieved uh, so far, but so we can identify the how to work in the relationship of developmental areas and to have an influence in other areas of action of the public policies. I would like us to come back to this topic by the end of my presentation, if there is any time left, to consider the future document and the challenge that it faces uh, and uh, and Mexico will be facing the organization of the following conference in this area. I will have additional comments afterwards. Uh, I don't want to take uh, more of your time. We thank Kurema. Let me welcome our dear friends, Carmen Ayon and Monica Luengo, and let me Thank you for joining our conversation. Let me give now the floor to Juan Luis Isasa Londoño. Good day, Saul. I thank you so much for allowing me to take the floor. First, let me thank the organizer of this important discussion forum. And basically you, Saul, as the chair of the Mexican chapter, and also Maria Guadalupe Cepeda Martinez as vice chair, and from here, let me also uh, greet Alejandra Frausto, Secretary of Culture of Mexico, and greet all my colleagues and friends that are participating in our conversation today. I've done several readings of this charter, and the first thing I want to say to you is I'm surprised with uh, this charter. I totally agree with what Jurema has expressed. I believe that the charter has an enormous scope. The charter or the document was premonitory in a series of things, and it anticipated to many areas that we have been developing in the different regions and countries. It is not a mere chance that this meeting, 2022, will be held in Mexico, and this 2022 Mondia Cult will be taking place in Mexico. First of all, let me uh, highlight 
Mexico's leadership in all of the areas that have to do with heritage and culture. If it is true that this is a reflection, a meeting that has universal uh, value, it is also anchored in our region of Latin America with a series of issues that I will be presenting from this region of the world that I'm sure are extrapolating to other continents, actors such as Asia Pacific, the Arabic countries, African countries, and the small island states. We are in a scenario in 1982 where there was quite a gap in regards to culture and, inno and innovation. All of the institutions uh, of our region in 1982 will still depending of a ministry of uh, culture. We had a series of old legislations, in many cases anachronic. We had a series of institutions that were not strong in our countries, with considerable exceptions. Budgets that were quite limited, technical staff that was not truly uh, duly trained, and heritage management that were based on material and monumental uh, sizes in Latin America and the Caribbean region. This heritage is been understood as a white, Hiberic, Catholic, male and monumental heritage. I totally fully agree with uh, Jurema. This charter did not come uh, by itself. I'm sure that there was a reflection uh, level globally that is now permeated within this charter that was quite pre premonitory and it was so very relevant. This charter of 1982, in many ways, it seems to me that touches areas that are not alien to our region. But it was also present in many other parts of the world. I find this very important because everything that it mentioned so very much in advance in regards to what we're having in our continent. We were present many years before the conventions of material and cultural heritage uh, management. This charter actually accentuated highly all of these areas. We were afar from having these sustainable goals, but this document of Mondia called 1982 was aiming clearly to have an, uh, an impact in a sustainable development also supported by what has to do with the cultural heritage. And in this regard, I believe that the charter is absolutely present. I think that we should intensify or highlight in a better way certain items or points of uh, our charter. But this is a really surprising document that also joining to what Kurema has shared with us in our region of Latin America and the Caribbean, there has been a considerable change marked among other things and basically by the institutional changes. Guatemala started a constitutional important change. We're still within cycles that are not over. Uh, Chile modifying its constitution and we have had important steps forward and uh, to understand in most of our countries the management of cultural goods. And of course, this has to do with plurinational uh, countries such as Bolivia and Chile. I believe that as a result of these new constitutions, there's been a better perspective of our management of cultural heritage. And this allows us to have a more holistic perspective For this pluri-ethnic and pluricultural rich environment where the presence of Afro-descending and indigenous people has had quite relevance in our future activities and cultural heritage. 
and their interaction. Basically, but of course, that many years ago, we were talking about cultural heritage, not only in Latin America, but all over the world. But I believe that this charter has been a turning uh, point. And well, our meeting will allow us to consider a series of things that are connected with the 1982 process. And it is this enormous wealth that cultural and material heritage has that has to do with the communities, with the peoples, with the ways of doing things, with traditions and mores that I we find so normal. For 1982, they were limited and uh, they were quite inviting. And of course, this Mandia Kult uh, document was pointing out this clearly. Uh, I conclude my participation here. Well, we have five minutes for the next uh, question. So I will, Kurema, uh, uh, the language in regards to the cultural policies has evolved since Mandia Kult 1982. How has this changed? your understanding of the cultures and the values of the society? Has this been a, a reason for change? Of course, yes, the language has changed as a consequence of the general principles that are in, within our Mondia called 1982 document. I believe that the main issue here that has been touched by Juan Luis of intangible assets and the cultural evolution is an idea connected with what is traditional in order to a series of expressions that include the possibility of change and the protagonism of the different communities and their involvement. In the same way, the participation in the cultural life that is not only perceived as unidirectional, from the state providing all the means for a cultural expression. But the movement uh, the other way, uh, uh, coming from the communities, as I have said, what I believe that we're really missing in terms of concrete consequences of this document is precisely the ability to introduce a more complex and holistic idea of developing other policies where we have different considerations of cultural issues and creating urban policies and environmental policies. So in terms of, uh, I don't know if I was clear in my question, but in terms of technology, I believe that it is an immediate reflection of the different concepts. Quite often, we use traditional terminology that were common up to 1982, but by introducing new meanings to uh, issues such as identity, uh, heritage concept, and the value concept. We thank you, Jurema. Juan Luis, the floor is yours now. Yes, I will thank you very much for giving me the floor. Now, I believe that more than changing, uh, give me a moment, more than a definite uh, 180 degree shift, I think we have been strengthening our ideas and uh, adapting these ideas. There's no drastic change. There's no shift of 180 degrees in regards to these concepts and statements that the document of 1982 contained. But nevertheless, I believe that it is like a continuous process. It's a way of moving forward that started perhaps within these uh, ICOMOS charters of 1964, the charter of Venice, the charter of Athens, how we are moving within this knowledge and deepening this knowledge. I myself also uh, reinforce what Jurema has expressed so clearly. There are new terms and that have given us new lenses to approach the same and old problems. But yet, let me highlight 
this uh, premonition that the document of 1982 contains. Uh, on the other hand, I totally agree with uh, Jurema, where she says that perhaps we've been missing the fact that this cultural heritage policies will be more horizontal, that they will permeate with other series of policies with urban development, with housing, with infrastructure, with the environment involved, but of course with life quality and of course with creative families. I insist and I believe that this is not a drastic change. It is deepening into a greater analysis and conceptualization in regards to these statements that the Charter contained in 1982. We thank you so much, Juan Luis, and well, Olympia will be sharing uh, her conclusions. Now, our next uh, uh, topic will be addressed with Carmen Añon, and I'm so proud to have with us Carmen Añon. Uh, I'm very uh, thrilled to have Carmen Añon with us, and also Francesco Bandarit, the 20th century cannot be understood in regards to uh, the cultural heritage management without Francesco Bandarin. Mandiacult 1982 is remembered as a global forum for the cultural policies development. Now, in this reflecting table, looking in Heinz uh, side, uh, do you think that this is still present? Well, I'm very thrilled to see so many uh, good old friends, and I will spend days uh, interacting with you. Um, I believe that, as a matter of fact, Mondiacult was in itself a document that was and that anticipated and has been of use for us for many years. That means that if the society changes, the world changes, and of course, if we need, we could call an updating of this document to the current needs. So yes, without uh, having, giving a uh, real valid uh, approach to all of the premises expressed in Mandia Cult 1982, by considering that all of us, we should do uh, what is a utopia, another document that could be acting almost uh, 40 years later, which at the moment that we have evolved at the speed that we are evolving right now with all of the new uh, IT industries, it is a utopia because now over uh, 10 years later, it's almost impossible to foresee what will happening. So let us be uh, sensitive to our old ways. I mean, we've done quite well so far. And now by considering about the future and thinking in the future, I would say, well, first of all, everything that we have here is absolutely valid and it may keep on helping us. So we should not leave behind at all the premises and statements that are established in Mondia Code 1982. So why are we supporting our defense for the heritage? which are the pillars that support good policies uh, of uh, heritage conservation. For me, there are three broad pillars, three pillars that could be, for example, if I look at the document that you have sent to us and that I have it right by my side, and that is easy to uh, uh, consult. In the first page of the document, we mentioned once the word site, and within the same first page, we mentioned place. And now, as uh, Isasa has clearly mentioned, we cannot disconnect heritage, cultural heritage, or intangible heritage from the natural or environmental heritage. Heritage is within, is immersed, coexisting. They are indivisible. Nowadays, we cannot get away from this 
unity from this deep intimacy among the sense of heritage, the sense of nature, the sense of the environment in its infinite varieties and differences from the very small garden up to the environment in all its diversity and scope. That is the first uh, point. Now, something that I wish not to uh, let go in this moment because it is so pre very present, but at the same time, I believe that it's also intrinsic in regards to the future of heritage, which is peace. I'm not talking about peace in Ukraine. That is another topic of our discussion. I'm referring to the defense of peace without harmony among the different peoples, without uh, discussing uh, to have an understanding, a conversation where there will be a possible distribution of knowledge and know-how with but unless we have peace, we cannot defend our heritage. So the defense of peace, the tool of personal peace and international uh, peace is basic for a possible uh, policies of uh, treating our heritage. And there is something also uh, that we leave behind. Uh, the defense has to do with our love of heritage and knowledge. Without schooling, without teaching uh, the school teachers so that they, from the very beginning, uh, from their young stage, will lead to knowledge, to learn about the wealth, the richness, the value, the history, the tradition, while we are not deepening uh, the first um, uh, stages of human beings uh, in the value of heritage, uh, you know, to take this deep leap, we will only achieve this in limited moments. That's why I believe that these three pillars are the ones that should support and develop in the future the uh, heritage policies. This is understanding of handcrafts or artisan uh, values, how to learn how to restore uh, good handcrafts, the knowledge, the deep knowledge of history. I believe these are basic pillars for the future of the defense of our cultural heritage. I thank you so much, uh, Francesco. The floor is now yours. Francesco Bandarin has the floor. Well, I, I am so pleased to meet with all of my friends. I'm really thrilled to see my friends. I haven't seen you in a long time, and I hope I'll get to see you very soon. Well, listen, in the world of culture and heritage, there are conferences that take place every year. Others take place every two years others every five years, others every 10 years, others every 20 years, such as habitat. This one takes place every 40 years. I mean, that is quite an important relevant point to bring to your attention. 40 years is a long time. We have to have a long-term scope. So then, first of all, we have to see what whatever happened 40 years before. Actually, Mondiacult's creation is uh, about 40 years before the creation of UNESCO. So we have to understand the relevance of UNESCO. So now the definition of culture of UNESCO was quite limited. It was a European elite definition that was, uh, they were the members of UNESCO basically at that time. I don't know if the uh, basic uh, text uh, which is a program that was created for UNESCO by Junior Axler, an English biologist. And he wrote a text that you can download. UNESCO, its purpose and philosophy. It is a fantastic uh, 
document because it has the vision of the situation, culturally speaking, and the political culture, cultural situation of that time. Within this document, we have everything. Now, the, this document was not adopted by the Assembly General. And I don't think that Axler was not really someone who that uh, UNESCO was very fond of, but he left a cultural heritage, uh, actually. But 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 he wasn't really uh, liked in major conferences. Now, Axler's definition was looking at culture such as arts and uh, writing. And UNESCO was involved with arts and documents and writing for many years and decades. And well, that was culture for them. Now, heritage came up later. It, we don't even have the world heritage in uh, the first uh, document. It came up later, given a demand of different demands, given international campaigns from Egypt, given the interest of the member states because heritage was obviously very important even before culture. You know, the studies of antiquities uh, started at the Renaissance times. <clears throat> so then, little by little, UNESCO organized these two domains, you know, arts and letters on the one side and heritage on the other side. And also the management of the cultural sector had two departments, one for arts and letters, and the other one was in charge of managing the cultural heritage. But it was a top-down vision, actually. This had to do with heritage, management, archaeology, and the protection of cultural heritage and the other institutions, such as libraries, artistic expressions, for disseminating culture. So this is when we had, we have, for example, the World Heritage Convention of 1972. So Mondia Cult was the precise moment of a general reflection regarding this vision. And it was a vision top down and to open up this vision to other elements that I find to be quite at the center of discussions. Diversity, cultural diversity was at the center of our discussion and sustainable development. This is quite clear. And I share this with my colleagues because it actually talks about what we are uh, working with it, it, because in our cultural management, we're working with development. So this is how we created two different paths. For example, the different uh, paths that led to the production of different cultural statements, the cultural diversity of, 20, of 2001, the convention of 2003, the convention of 2005, and many other conventions, and also how it influenced heritage, because heritage also had to open up to diversity. The, uh, the NADA declaration is a, an example of this. The inclusion of cultural landscaping, another element. Also, the creation of some uh, uh, charters that have developed by looking at the societies. The Charter of Burray is a clear example of this. And then we have done, in these 40 years, we have gone through a very important path uh, as a result of Mondia Cult 1982. Now, after Mondia Cult, we have the report of Perez de Cuellar that is a pillar regarding cultural diversity, the Stockholm uh, Conference of 2008 regarding culture and heritage, and the World Bank in 2009. And afterwards, the major work regarding the SDGs, which is the current topic, 
with uh, cultural uh, heritage being a part of the major uh, SDGs. And I think we have to mention the Habitat Conference of 2016, that it is an important moment of culture as a part of all of this discussion. So there are two cornerstones of Mondiacult because heritage and development have grown. The topic that will be interesting in the future to analyze and how this is translated into the current discourse. What will be the Mondial 2022 message? It's 40 years. And we have to look at the next 40 years and the goals and the topics that have been expressed if we will achieve them or not. And I have many concerns about uh, uh, Juan Luis has talked about many steps forward into more democratic management of culture. But if this is taking place all over the world, I'm not so certain. I wonder if uh, culture is becoming so democratic all over the world. I see many steps uh, back in uh, many parts of the world. Also, the development of culture, cultural heritage is not so clear. So we need to have an honest discourse of what is truly happening with sustainable growth and development. Because basically, uh, growth and development is more a lip service and it's not so much uh, real culture. I mean, we're dealing more with trade. So I think that we have to look at Mandia Cool 2022. What is going to be the message of 2022? What is going to be the contribution of Mandia Cool 2022? Well, that's what I want to share with you. Thank you so much. We thank you, uh, Francesco. The next question is the term immaterial uh, heritage was used officially during the Mondiacult 1982 meeting for the first time. How has this focus of culture uh, changed so far? Let me give the floor now to Carmen. I think that the immaterial heritage is a topic that is so very complex in itself as a term that we cannot accept a single definition that will cover all the complexity of this area. Because in material heritage, really, I wouldn't dare to define it. I mean, because if I, uh, if I should be able to give a definition, I have no idea. There are so many definitions up to this very moment that uh, uh, cover the cultural diversity and to say that we are uh, considering the diversity of cultures is not to be uh, in uh, within the reality because this is such an enormous uh, diversity in itself that we cannot define it within a document. I personally believe that what is interesting if we want to move forward and always moving forward, however much we try and wish uh, to have it at the international level, it will have a focalization in different countries, but the recommendation that could come up uh, perhaps of this meeting would be to ask our international ICOMOS to establish a program that will be well-defined, that will not leave and will be supported uh, in its in sub programs you know in cantabria we are an international organization and we have the support of many countries and well and if we see the different regions and continents and cultural regions in the world and if we divide this they could establish their own sub programs and update them in the discussion, in the knowledge, the understanding, the dissemination, the outreach 
of these cultural values without having years go by in which we need to establish different charters, but by acting and acting so they will have a more direct involvement of the national ICOMOS chapters in major groups and subgroups and the request of a program that will give origin to sub activities. And I think that we go, we have to go from the, what is programmatic, what is uh, uh, overarching uh, to the small area. Because let me say that I had not had time to think about this, but this is my perspective. And I haven't had a chance to, to read how well you had prepared all this. So particularly, let me express this. But let me say to you, but programs that for years will go, let's say like one by month in such a site, in such a city, in such a region, and with different publications, I mean, more activity. And in ICOMOS, we are, my feeling is that we are falling asleep in our laurels with the major charters that are wonderful and excellent documents of reference. And I mean, they're useful, you know, to bring them up in every speech. And I mean, we look quite well. And it seems that we have been considering all of this, but it's not enough. I believe that here we must act, react and act within the school, within the town, within the cities. And to achieve through this, this multi-program uh, coming from a small structure, from a general structure. This is to ask ICOMOS, let us to move more. And uh, let me say that I'm not the one who moves the most, and let me put the blame on me, but, but I believe that we've got to work much more from the international level to the national level and to the local level with structural programs that will uh, force us for having concrete actions, quite more frequent, quite more useful. And I mean, I'm saying by this that, of course, meetings like this are quite useful. This is a wonderful reference, of course, but I think we need much more. My message is much more. So I leave you uh, with this. We thank you, Carmen. Uh, Francesco. A quick comment. I'm not so pleased with this in material uh, term, but I believe it is a category, of course. I don't understand quite well why we use this term and why the material heritage has many elements to be perceived as we see it. So sometimes I, we have to accept what we have uh, within the world. So, well, let's have try to use it in the best possible way. But I believe it's an idea that calls for a uh, re-identification. The term was proposed for given the to give dignity to the culture elements of material and immaterial heritage. I mean, it was like a B-class uh, heritage. I mean, it had to do with the heritage uh, of the people. You know, things such as folklore. I hate this word. You know, fortunately, the uh, intangible uh, heritage has changed as part of the global heritage. This is very important. And also, we are moving forward in regards to the relationship regarding the classic sense of heritage, you know, cultural heritage, monuments, uh, and the communities. That is a critical issue here. The relationship among the heritage and the society that's quite often is lost when the heritage is extracted from the society. And that is the subject of other discussions or other interests that of course are noble interests, but sometimes it's the least noble interest when we extract a cultural heritage and it upsets the environment. I believe that therefore this should be the core element the focal point of our discussion in Mondial 2022, the relationship between culture 
and heritage, the society in all of its forms, not only communities, not only in groups or cities that are highly articulated. But this relationship is critical to give new life to heritage. If we don't invest in these connection, the heritage is going to be more commercial and it will lose its, its function and its role within society. I see many dangers in this, in the, world, in the life of world heritage that is highly state owned. And I see it, how major industries in the world are carrying out uh, heritage and they are serious dangers because because they're quite afar from the major and main goals and we may lose future generations so that is really part of the objectives of Mondial 2022 what is the role of future generations in regards to their interaction with heritage they are uh, core for the future if we're speaking about long-term perspectives in Mondial 2022. Well, let me thank all of you. Now we have our next topic. We will approach this topic with Francisco Lopez Morales and Monica Luengo. And the question here is, have we developed several conventions and charters as a direct result of the 1982 Mondial Cult meeting. Have you had the expected uh, scope and where do you believe we have not been sufficient? Let me give the floor now to Monica Luengo. Well, good afternoon. I'm here uh, in a close company. Well, of course, now when I see you on the screen, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Well, let me appreciate that 40 years have gone by and we have this wonderful technologies that allow us to be all here together. But it's also a pity that these new technologies are not allowing us to be physically together, which I think we all miss that. But nevertheless, let me express my gratitude for this invitation and for this opportunity in order to reflect in regards to these 40 years that culture has had. Now, when we talked about new documents and new conventions and new international documents, uh, I was considering the sustainable uh, development and the roadmap that we have now in the 2030 agenda and the SDGs. Why culture is not a part of this? Why? in 40 years, we have not achieved that culture will be this fourth pillar for development. Why are we insisting today that Mondial 1982 and the document is still present? I mean, it's just so updated. And I wonder if anything has changed. Of course, we know that we have cultural diversity in material heritage. And of course, there are many other areas that have changed. But Francesco, when we talk about heritage, I believe that heritage in all of the document of the SDGs, I think it's mentioned only once. I'm not sure if it is up once, only once in the 17 goals. I think oh, it is 11.4 that it is mentioned only once. And I brought here the this document only when we talked about doubling our efforts to protect and safeguard the cultural and natural heritage of the world. Even though UNESCO states that culture is the core and cross-cutting element of sustainable growth, what is true here is that cultural rights, the heritage, diversity, and creativity of which Mondiacult 1982 was referring to haven't grow, uh, developed uh, duly. We're all here celebrating that we will hold Mondia Cult once again 40 years later. But unfortunately, 
we have not reached what we expected 40 years ago. And it is not that we haven't had a recognition of the relevance of culture, indigenous cultures and native uh, people's uh, culture have been recognized, that we haven't used culture as a leveler to reduce uh, gender inequality. So culture should truly be this fourth pillar together with the economic impacts, the social impacts and environmental impact. And culture is the maximum expression of where human beings have managed to express themselves, being in science, arts, uh, writings, culture, it, that is heritage. And how we have achieved and conceived this in 40 years, and even though we have had important documents, I'm sure that you have all referred to uh, cultural diversity, uh, material heritage, the different inventions in Alaric and so many other conventions that have, are so many initiatives and documents of ICOMOS. There are so many other documents and international uh, bodies involved, but we should consider if the situation has truly changed where we have culture nowadays. I mean, we had with the SDGs the opportunity, shouldn't we have included them? Because in a given date, they were a limited phenomena, but shouldn't we have included them now as a, a critical part in many of the SDGs or even to at least have one single goal, culture as what we're talking about now, talking about education, heritage, identity of the peoples, human rights. Here, let me express my opinion, my discording opinion, by sadly, let me say to you that I believe that we haven't moved forward enough. And Pancho, the floor is yours. Now tell me that you don't agree with me. I thank you, Monica. Uh, Pancho, the floor is yours now. I, uh, I'm sorry, your microphone is off, sir. Uh, uh, Mr. Francisco, your microphone is off. Thank you. I would like to react as a bull with two uh, banderillas that Monica has given me. And I have understood the sense of the evolution that we have had since 1982. I believe that as uh, Bandarin has mentioned with pertinence, we should see this as an evolution in a longer uh, period, at least perhaps by calling the wise words that were stated with something that Carmen Añon has already referred to us with pertinence and insistence in regards that UNESCO was founded in 1945 and 46. And it's it, and a quote, an extraordinary quote that was quite overwhelming and pertinent for today's considerations. That was that given that within the wars are born in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men where we should build up the values of peace. At this very moment, this quote retakes an important value because we have to speak about the fact that as a matter of fact, in those times when there is no war, there were moments as to think and to manage and reflect about culture and to know that everything that was expressed in the 1982 meeting in Mexico, in the Mondiacul meeting, is where we perceive with clarity the cultural policies of the different countries. 
it seems to me that the answer could be positive, definitely speaking, but not complete. It is incomplete because we have seen that there are many things that are left behind of the evolution of the ways of thinking of the different nations and the topic of sustainable development, the topic of the communities, the issue of the shared heritage. At that time, they, these concepts were not clear. And I'm saying this because in the 1962 convention, it went from the Venice Charter my dear friend and colleague and thinker Susana Sampaio in Brazil was making reference to the preamble of the Venice Charter, where in a quote, she it said everything that entailed the future. And that is that the monuments are evoking the spirituality of the world. And uh, by making a summary of this where the spiritual part of the monuments is indicating to us that we had to develop this immaterial uh, heritage from tangible heritage. I believe that it is here where we have to break down in our thoughts, which are those elements that are critical in understanding. Um, throughout the documents of Mundiacul, after this, there are two major conventions that those that have taken the floor before me were making a reference to that are the topics of the 2005 convention and those that have to do with the convention that has had major repercussions worldly, which is the convention for the immaterial safeguarding heritage. Uh, here we are not talking about sealed heritage or living heritage or material heritage. But we are talking here of the living heritage where what we are safeguarding will not leave us without protection, but it's a permanent action to be able to understand this whole process that is also translated in what is natural. I believe that here we have heard the opinions expressed by the Danada Charter, because I believe that the Western cultures have contributed considerably to know that integrity and authenticity are not only translated in a material uh, overwhelming concept, but within the Nara's Charter, we are making reference to the fact of the need of understanding that we're also talking about living heritage, where the topics such as actions and reproduction of different actions can be also understood within the concepts of integrity and authenticity of culture. My consideration is that at this point, we are in a turning point, uh, which is critical in order to conduct a deep analysis and exercise of the review of the charters, the documents, and the programs that UNESCO uh, has developed clearly in order to know which are those areas where we have not so far given an answer to uh, that is truly overwhelming to the demands that have been expressed throughout the previous time. I am talking here, for example, about the fact that it is stated 
that within the 1972 convention, we're talking about the fifth C, which is the participation of the communities, and that this participation within the convention of 2003, we are also expressing this, but where UNESCO has not had the possibility and perhaps to talk about the capability of understanding which are those elements and the reivindications that are expressed in each of those monuments and elements that are the two accepted terms within the conventions that truly will understand the deep sense of the demands of these communities in terms of giving an answer. I'm not saying support in uh, economic support, but a an advisory support, uh, a support that will be responding to what the communities have expressed as their needs for a guiding element of their actions in a permanent way. I believe that here lies some pending assignments, which our Mondiacult reflection should be quite alert in order to give a response to those elements that we have not yet achieved. I may say the very same, and we had some problems in referring to the topic of the cultural landscapes and all of these uh, elements that have been uh, presented throughout the past 40 years and that we have to see how far these limitations are or their boundaries or which are the priorities in the different actions of the future and we have the obligation at least to give them some guiding lines and also point them out as a guideline for whomever will be liable and having the responsibility of setting the roadmaps uh, and how at the level of the society uh, they will have a relevance, but also at the level of the government officials, they have to be considering all of those elements that tend to modify or perhaps also to break away with the values with the risk of being fully recognized globally. I do not know if I have made myself clear fully, but within the environment, there is a lot of uh, opportunities and anticipations. Now, also based in what Francesco Bandanin has just mentioned in regards to the topic regarding that there are many areas that regretfully, they're not yet within our field and our scope, such as social political issues that are distracting at the very least the attention from what is really basic. And I'm referring to very concrete issues that we should have to give an answer at least at the level of what we have to do. I am considering, for example, the enormous, and I'm sure that this is quite clear for Saul, but the enormous wearing down that is expressed in the cultural landscaping of Xochimilco. What is the clear answer that we're going to give ourselves as a society if the government officials in this given case, the local or regional officials are not accompanying us in this uh, ruling, in this verdict, there are so many things over the table. Now, another element that I find to be critical is that of uh, encouraging 
the horizontal dialogue among those categories that are sharing common problems. I believe that this is another element that remains pending. And in the case of, of course, of the conventions, the topic of being consequent with an aspiration that is repeated constantly in each of the conclusions of the meetings of the different committees and their conclusions is dialogue and articulating in the different areas that will enable to act in parallel. My belief is that it is very important also that since we are celebrating 40 years of Mondiacult 1982, but also in a very, in very few months, we will be celebrating 50 years of the convention that has been the, the one that has been the most ratified convention of UNESCO, which is the convention of 1972, in which we bring together two uh, concepts regarding heritage, maybe even three, the definitions, the natural, the cultural, and the hybrid or mixed uh, conventions. So we are in, at that moment of forcing ourselves not only to celebrate what we have done, of course we have to celebrate, but more so we have to have a joint reflection that will enable us to start disentangling all of those elements uh, that are absolutely critical to overcome uh, the problems. I personally believe, and I am preparing, or we are preparing a uh, document for this, but the main premise here is to have a, conduct a self-criticism and a critical uh, critic of what is it we've done, what is it we have not, uh, we've done wrong, and in which direction we should be uh, tracing a new path with a positive vision. I will leave my reflection this far. Pancho, we thank you so much. We have a few minutes. Monica, since 1982, culture and heritage have been from being a government issue and they have now under the control of the state uh, control and the private sphere. Do you think this is an outcome of the changes of political policies uh, for culture that Mondiacul uh, had, or is this a public promotion of change? Well, since I am creating this discussion, I'm giving you all of these points of uh, controversy for a, a discussion. I don't fully agree in regards to the fact that we have had this uh, governmental abandonment and that we have gone more to the private sector. Yes, I believe we have more private sector initiatives that have come to join the governmental initiatives and even international perspectives. But well, uh, well I don't believe that we have had uh, minimizing the role of the major uh, administrations. I believe that an exemplary case here is UNESCO and the global convention during uh, these past uh, 40 years. So therefore, I believe that we have not minimized the role, the official role, but all the opposite. I believe it has been an incentive for many other private sector initiatives. Let me share with you, uh, we go back to the cultural landscape. But as Carmen was saying, in this union of culture and nature, which is the one that is at the foundation of the Convention of the National and Cultural Heritage of 1972. Now, unfortunately, this option has, fa has been a failing one. It is true 
that given the Francisco's mandate, there was an attempt uh, of a global uh, convention of landscaping that uh, has somehow failed, but this is a landscape where we have to consider the major two lines of the UNESCO program that has to do with the natural and global heritage and biodiversity. And to understand biodiversity beyond the word of culture, I find it difficult to continue with this division. Everything is united. And well, if we have the diversity of cultures together with this and the intangible heritage uh, uh, declaration, I think that this has acted as an encouragement for many other small conventions at the regional level, like the Lali uh, Convention, the uh, landscaping, and other major initiatives, such as we should remember that the first uh, Pop Pope Francisco, the first uh, encyclic, being Catholic or not, but this is a document directed to two billion people, and it is dedicated to caring of the common uh, household. And this gives an environmental sense, but understanding this as culture, as what we are talking about, as the basis of an approach from the point of view of human rights and the well-being of the communities. So therefore, I would not say that we have not minimized this. Um, but these major initiatives, uh, failed initiatives or non-failed initiatives, as the global landscaping uh, convention, but it helps that many regions have become aware of this problem. So then, I am not in full agreement with the fact that we have been directing this only to a global framework, but on the contrary, it has helped as a promotion, as an engine, as a promoter of other initiatives that we can say at a lower scale, but not less important. And now I open up the floor for Pancho again. So he will come in as a bull. Pancho, the floor is yours. Your microphone is turned off, Pancho. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, I'd like to emphasize the fact that right now we're at a parting of waters and it's a very important moment in order to be able to meet and have this new meeting in September to review and commemorate the 40th anniversary of Mondia Cult. I think it's a great moment to reflect deeply. Firstly, I understand that there are several actors. UNESCO also needs a deep, a profound review of where it wants to direct its policies in different sector, in different sectors. I believe it's very important that we have a dialogue for this, both at a level of the states that are taking part in this body together in all of their sectors and in the new protagonism that the communities have taken, that is communities with the capital C. I believe we need to set some clear rules to know how we can establish 
this dialogue. I'm speaking from a normative point of view, because if the states that are part of this, that form the main bodies of the United Nations and the different regional bodies, it's also necessary to define clearly how societies together, communities locally, can engage in the aspects that have to do directly with a legal recognition. That's one point. The other point that I was reminded of would be the fact of articulating and seeing how we view the topic of natural means, the topic that's surrounding it, and the factors within those means. I think it's a challenge and a great opportunity to understand how we're going to establish the rules for coexistence between these different categories. Thank you very much, Pancho. It's been a pleasure to listen to our six panelists. And we've definitely seen how this declaration in Mexico is still relevant. I've been told that we need to finish punctually. So I would just like to address something that concerns us. It mentions here at this point, the founding principle of cultural relations is the restitutions of their various works. These, this can be reinforced to sustain their efficiency. This is something we've seen in various areas of the country. And it was marvelous to see this in an anthropomorphous setting. I think we've also seen a lot of different artworks that have been marvelous as well that represent this. I'm very grateful to everybody. It was a pleasure to listen to all of the different points. And we are all, we're gonna move on now to concluding remarks. So please go ahead. Thank you, Olympia. Thank you, Saul, and thank you to everybody. I've shared a document in English because I've translated my concluding remarks. The event of 1982 is important today. A lot has changed in the in recent decades. We've had progress in science, and we've seen a lot of changes in the environment, in culture, in education. And the scope of these things has also extended and deepened in our societies. The global conference has introduced important concepts such as political policies, cultural community, and more than anything, Article 10 has promoted the idea of culture, that which constitutes a fundamental dimension 
of the process of development to strengthen independence, sovereignty, and identity. This seminary, this seminar, rather, addresses these important topics. Our participants have been promoting the importance of the impacts of the different international conventions from the Declaration of 1982. An import, important topic is training professionals and officers to be able to address this topic. The declaration continues to be relevant and should still be applied in all areas. Francesco Bandarin and others have proposed different ideas in order to continue to defend heritage. This is a topic that has to do with the new tasks connected to local communities. Today, we have to analyze heritage in terms of peace. It has to do with education, integration, and we have to have open dialogue relating to this question of heritage. Also in regard to laws, we have to understand the progress we've made for the next convention. Another idea is the concept of immaterial heritage. It has to be reanalyzed. Monica Luengo and Francisco Lopez Morales have talked about the concepts that have not been sufficiently developed in recent decades. It has to be an expression of cultural heritage as well as territorial heritage. Another interesting point has been cultural policies that have been developed since 1982 and how this language has favored the conversations surrounding values, national values and heritage values. We want to open new doors and create a path to continue discussing the value of heritage. More than anything, we want to understand the centrality that communities have in developing cultural heritage. There is no doubt that we need to take the opportunity to continue developing these elements. We are continuing to act and develop a more holistic and active perspective to address these sustainable development goals. According to the 2030 agenda, I'd especially like to speak, uh, thank the speakers and everyone who will be hosting us at our next date. Thank you very much for those conclusion, concluding remarks. Next, we're passing the floor to uh, Juan Luis. This is a topic that concerns me especially, and I think it concerns all of us who are here. In regard to the goals of 1982, they there were very general goals and also very specific goals. I'd like to make a recommendation regarding the attention that countries, governments, NGOs, and universities pay uh, to the issue of management. 
in regard to traditional artisanry and other topics that we've talked about today. I think we need to take big steps in regard to managing this. It has to do, for example, with the preservation of natural spaces or some of the other areas that we've seen. I think we need to mention this, the need to, the need to protect the interpreter apologizes the speaker's connection is weak. We need to address the topic of conservation and, and preservation in regard to cultural heritage. The interpreter apologizes the connection of the speaker has been lost and there is no more sound. I think I completely agree with Juan Luis. In Mexico, we've had a lot of problems with the church fire of the famous church and the wood paintings inside. It's been a few years, a, a few decades, and it's been restored by the community. And then after the 2010 earthquakes, there was a lot of community engagement we haven't concluded all the restoration of, of what was damaged by the 2017 damage. earthquake. Thank you very we much, Juan Luis. Luis. Well, let I'd me now like give, to give the floor, floor now to, to Maria, Maria Guadalupe, Guadalupe Cepeda Martinez. Cepeda Mar Thank you very much. Let me uh, speak a few words, then we will have a video now. Uh, let me thank the participation of the expert panel members. Also, let me express my gratitude to those that were present in the 1982 conversation. I think it is a true recognition for your participation in 1982. We have to recognize that thanks to the work and the reflection that took place then, it is possible now to set the important bridges in order to welcome the legacy of our cultural heritage in with in full integrity. Let me also express my gratitude to all of the panel members that have set their uh, important bridges uh, in their participation today in the understanding of the concept and the experience that are directed to the new generations. So we certainly honor uh, all of those persons that were uh, attending to that Mondial called 1982 that took place here in Mexico City. Now we have a short video clip. Thank you very much. Michel Parent, former president of ICOMOS International 1981-1987. Jorge Alberto Manrique Castañeda, former chair of ICOMOS from Mexico, 1980-1988. Sergio Saldivar Guerra, member of ICOMOS, Mexico. We thank you so much for your contribution during the meeting held in 1982, International Council on Monuments and Sites, ICOMOS. Saul, thank you very much. We thank you, Guadalupe. Let me thank all the jóvenes en patrimonio for the support. Well, let me just give now the floor to Gabriel Caballero for his closing uh, remarks. 
Gabriel, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, thank you, Saul, and thank you, everyone. I think it was a very enriching conversation. I've been uh, paying attention uh, um, uh, through the uh, translated uh, language, and it is uh, 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 very good to hear it from uh, with the, the support of the um, government of Mexico and the cultural department. I just wanted to uh, highlight a couple of things before we leave and share a little bit more what will happen in the future. Uh, I heard a lot of interventions, and uh, I do agree in in, in many of the you know, provocations, particularly Monica's and uh, Carmen has uh, provided uh, um, really good points, and, and everyone else. The, the for us, um, I think uh, as uh, members of civil society, as uh, people who are uh, doing it uh, as, as as our passion, I think we need to really uh, strengthen that voice. In this, in this meeting in Mondeco, it is a UNESCO meeting, uh, civil society is going to be involved, but it is the, the, the voices of our, let's say, uh, UNESCO um, colleagues in the government that will be uh, pushing forward, but we need to be active and uh, really push our uh, agenda that cultural policies require actors like us to shift and create that mindset that uh, culture and heritage policies are anchored to people to the ground. Um, uh, I think the, we, need to, uh, we need to do more. As uh, 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 more, uh, Carmen has said, e is, uh, uh, there has been a lot of uh, documentation in terms of, uh, let's say, charters. But we also need to look at reflections. Uh, uh, as uh, uh, we, we were, uh, Pancho was saying, that uh, we need to reflect on things that have happened in the past, but also uh, in order to create new ideas, we need to synthesize that and move forward with new ideas that are also based on uh, actions on the ground. Um, the, the, I, I was reminded by the, the regional conversations that happened for Mondeco uh, when Juan Luis uh, uh, provided his intervention which is um, our, our Vice President, uh, Leonardo Castiota, uh, uh, got the ECMOS presidents and various colleagues from the Latin American region. And one of the things that was highlighted in that um, intervention was the rights of indigenous peoples and embracing diversity in the region. I think that is something that we need to keep in mind when we uh, uh, talk about cultural diversity. It is not just about the diversity of the than the various nations, but also beyond that, the local diversity needs to be embraced. And this is also part of that intervention that ECMOS provided for the Latin American region. Um, one one um, high, highlight that uh, we also need to think about is the uh, what is what um, put people together in 1982 was the danger of homogenizing uh, cultures, which is everyone was becoming one and the same because of the same, let's say, uh, news that we see, same uh, information. And right now, 40 years after, we have the internet that also creates one type of culture. And how do we create a diversified culture in this time of technology? And we are all converging into one type of uh, globalized culture. I think we need to think about that and push for the diversity among us. And uh, regional perspectives are quite important. So I'll just share a little bit of what uh, will happen in the, in after this. Um, uh, so let me share my slide. So uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is one of three events that we're doing. Uh, the, the first event is uh, Looking Back, which we did today. Another event will happen in July, which is a, a topic that is looking forward, the future of heritage policy and the SDGs. And uh, we are calling upon our uh, emerging professionals from ECOMOS to think with us and uh, think of what is uh, potential um, uh, ideas for the future. And uh, I think the chair of uh, Heritage Futures will also be joining us. And of course, uh, ECOMOS Mexico and the uh, um, uh, cultural um, the part of Mexico as well. And uh, we will all converge on the, in September uh, in the, the Monaco um, uh, conference. And there will be a, a two-day workshop that will be happening. 
And I do hope that uh, some of you or uh, many of you who are here can also be there uh, with everyone. It is uh, meant to be on the 20th, uh, 26th, uh, if everyone can come on the 25th, but we will give more information about this. And we want to see a, a place uh, there in, the, in, in Mexico, which is the Chinampas, which is a cultural landscape, which is uh, testing the real um, situation where the heritage, cultural landscapes, and sustainability comes together. And um, um, I think that is uh, um, the first announcement, but uh, by in the next couple of months, uh, we will give you more information about this. Um, I really appreciate everyone's attendance and uh, do hope that uh, we see each other again. And uh, I look forward to more conversations uh, here over Zoom and of course in Mexico in September. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gabriel por esta, esta relatoría y sobre todas las actividades que vienen, que están extraordinarias. Bien. We thank you so much for uh, sharing the future activities that are really wonderful. And let me now give the, my gratitude to Alejandra Frausto, the Federal Minister of Culture in Mexico, and also Adriana Cariaga can share uh, our greetings. We thank, uh, Carmen Añón, Francesco Bandari, Francesco López Morales, Pancho López, eh, Olimpia Niglio, Monica Luengo, Jurema Machado, Juan Luis Isaza, Carmen Añón, and all the colleagues in Mexico, and also Maria Guadalupe and Karina. It's been a wonderful, I'm so pleased and joyful to see you. And let me just uh, take advantage of this moment of expressing to Carmen Añón my gratitude for all our students that have been graduated through your catalog. And, and I'm sure that this decalogue will give us so much more. I certainly appreciate your contribution, you. Madam Agnon. And well, I wish all of you a wonderful day, a wonderful afternoon, a wonderful week, and we shall meet again in July. And thank, I thank you so much. And if you are so kind as to switch your cams on, and I can take a family photo. Ready. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. We thank you for being invited. It's been a wonderful panel. Thank you so much for inviting us over. We thank ICOMOS Mexico. Thank you so much. Best greetings. Thank you very much. Best greetings and thank you. Muito obrigado, Jurema. Muito obrigado com você. Muito obrigado. We thank you, Jurema. We thank you so much. Jurema, gracias. We thank you, Jurema. Let me thank you, Maria de Guadalupe. Farewell.